Hey, what's going on, role players? It's the Bard here, and welcome back to the corner. So, what's on the books for today? Please make a video about the most slash least used monsters. I'm thinking about being a DM, and I keep seeing the same monsters used, and it gets old. We need to bring out those monsters no one uses. Good for you. I'm pleased you want to be a DM. It can be one of the most satisfying things to put together a great epic campaign and have all your friends really enjoy the story you've presented for them. But I see exactly what you're saying. Every time we start off a new campaign, it's always orcs, goblins, hobgoblins, kobolds, all the same kind of things. So, yeah, we should definitely try to use some different monsters. But anyone who knows me will know that that's just not enough for me. Something else has to be put into this video as well. So not only are we going to pick some interesting new monsters to make use of, I'm also going to show you a few combinations that can really make it difficult for your player characters. So everyone and their grandmother have been fighting against orcs, goblins, kobolds since the dawn of time. So it's time to bring out some different monsters. So something I'm going to suggest, if you look at your campaign and the sort of areas you have within it, you might want to almost relegate certain monsters to particular areas. That way those creatures become synonymous with a particular area, and you expect to see them or battle against them when in particular places. Rather than just having a bunch of random monsters that appear for whatever reason, when you have some consistency in the creatures that are appearing, it gives it a bit more of a sense of realism. At least in my opinion anyway. Okay, so let's get started. So first of all, we're going to want to look at some of the challenge ratings of the monsters. So a monster's challenge rating tells you just how big a threat the monster is. So your average four-person party should have a good battle against a creature of equal challenge rating without suffering too many difficulties. So therefore, if a challenge rating one creature is a good challenge for a four-person party, then essentially, when you begin the game, you're looking at challenge rating one quarter and having four of those particular kinds of creatures that would be one for each party member. So what creature is a decent battle at challenge rating one quarter? I think troglodytes are probably one of my favourite challenge level one quarter creatures because they have really good abilities. They start off with dark vision up to 60 feet, meaning you can go in any ecology you like. So if you want to put them in a dark dungeon or if you want to put them outside, it's going to work either way. There are also creatures that have the capacity to have advantage on dexterity stealth checks, so this means they're good ambush monsters, especially when you consider the fact they have multi-attack. Multi-attack, two claws and a bite. If that catches someone unaware, it's going to do a lot of damage and it can really set a party on the back foot. Troglodytes are not complicated creatures, however. They use very basic tactics. So, they're the kind of creature that actually rewards clever players for using tactics because they have sunlight sensitivity. So if you can draw those creatures out into a position where they're going to have that disadvantage, then it actually helps to make the battles that much more tactical against them. For me, however, my favorite part of the troglodyte is its stench ability. Whenever a creature comes within five feet of it, it needs to make a constitution check or become poisoned. It's bad enough having disadvantage on your attack rolls, but you also have disadvantage on ability checks as well. Theoretically, if a pack of troglodytes could stealth up behind a party, they could overwhelm them with their stench first, forcing constitution checks, and any who fail would have disadvantage on their subsequent initiative roll when the combat begins. Not only would your troglodytes have a surprise round, but they'd also get to go first on the initiative in their regular turns as well. You can use troglodytes over and over because you can pair them up with creatures that are immune to poison, so Quagoths, for instance. These two monsters aren't a natural pairing, but they would probably be in the same sort of ecology. So if you're having a battle with one of these particular types of creatures, after a couple of rounds, maybe a pack of troglodytes will come in and start attacking the party whilst they're dealing with a Quagoth or vice versa. This would suddenly make the fight that much more difficult because all the player characters will have to save against poison in order to not get disadvantage. However, the Quagoths, they're naturally immune to poison, so even if they do fight with the rest of the party, even if some of the troglodytes do start attacking the Quagoths, it really doesn't make a difference. It's going to be the players that have to deal with that stench and have to deal with those saving throws that they're making, whilst all the other creatures just get to fight at their normal base level. And that's another thing you need to know if you're going to be a DM. When it comes to monsters, don't fight fair. Never fight fair. 
because it's always much more interesting for your player characters if they have to overcome seemingly impossible odds. It's so much more tense and exciting when the battles aren't going just I attack you then you attack me. When other things start happening, when there are more complications, when there are more tactical advantages or disadvantages to concern themselves with, the players will probably have a lot more fun. So never ever fight fair. I say this all the time, just make sure you're always putting your party not at a disadvantage all the time, but you do want to make sure they're challenged. My second choice for a one quarter challenge rating creature has to be the Grimlock. Now this isn't an amazing creature, but it does have some really good abilities, as well as being able to kick out an awful lot of damage. So first of all, they have advantage when they're in rocky terrain due to their stone camouflage. This is perfect for any naturally made underground dungeon. They also have advantage on wisdom perception checks when it comes to hearing and smell, making them very, very difficult to try to stealth past. But they're also the kind of creature that can reward players who think about the encounter. Illusions that create sound figments, making noises in other areas to draw them away, these are all tactics that you can use to potentially bypass an encounter or a battle with a pack of Grimlocks. But one of their most interesting abilities is their blind sense. They don't actually need to be able to see in order to fight. These creatures can't be flashed, so they don't suffer any penalties from things like that. You can't use illusions to make yourself invisible because they don't care about that. They'll just find you anyway. So they're very, very interesting creatures. But one of the best things that you can do with them is to pair them up with creatures with gaze attacks like basilisks. As long as the basilisk can see the target and the target can see the basilisk, it can potentially turn to stone. But since Grimlocks can't see anything, they are completely immune to what the Basilisk can do. Therefore, if you're having to deal with a bunch of Grimlocks whilst fighting a Basilisk, they're going to be perfectly capable of fighting while the Basilisk continues to try to turn other creatures to stone. Basilisks, however, are a challenge rating of 3, which might be a little bit too high for your starting parties. But if you wanted to pull off a similar combination that's not quite so deadly, why not consider using Dark Mantles? Dark Mantles can produce the Darkness Aura, which doesn't affect them and it doesn't affect Grimlocks, allowing them to fight in it quite normally. But your normal average party isn't going to be able to fight effectively within the Darkness Radius. There are a few classes that can get around it, things like Warlocks with Devil Sight, for example, but still not every party has access to Devil Sight, and even if they do have a Warlock with it, it's only useful for that one particular character. So moving on to Challenge Rating 1 then, and a creature that I don't see used very often is the Harpy. Harpies aren't amazing combatants, their to hit roll is pretty poor and their damage is only average, but their most useful ability is their Luring Song. It has a range of up to 300 feet, so for the most part it could be heard throughout an entire dungeon, because that would cover an enormous amount of radius. You can combine Harpies with so many other creatures because the Luring Song only affects humanoids and giants, but what it's best used for is other creatures like Grey Oozes. Grey Oozes have a natural immunity to the Harpy's charm, but they also have the false appearance, meaning they're indistinguishable from just a normal puddle on the floor. So essentially what would happen is, whilst the target that's been charmed by the Harpy's song is moving towards the Harpy, not knowing where she is, that target will be moving through corridors and not noticing the fact that there's a Grey Ooze there because it's completely indistinguishable. Additionally, the Harpy can be used with any kind of creature that has immunity to her charm and has the false appearance. A good example of this would be animated objects. Therefore, you can use the Harpy alongside animated armors, flying swords, rugs of smothering, or you can use other monsters like scarecrows or even mimics. In fact, if you wanted to be really mean to your players, you can incorporate a Shrieker and some Violet Fungi. Place the Shrieker at the beginning of your dungeon and have it shriek as soon as the players enter. That way, its scream is audible from up to 300 feet away. The Harpies will hear this and it will be a cue for them to start singing, and then their song can be heard also at up to 300 feet away. So as soon as the players enter the dungeon, they instantly have to contend with the Harpy's song. If any of them fail, they start moving towards the Harpy and have to start through moving through patches of Violet Fungi. Something that makes this quite scarily effective is that any creature killed by a Violet Fungus decomposes rapidly and new Violet Fungi sprout from the mouldering corpse, growing to full size in 2d6 days. In that respect, it's a fun little narrative thing. Once your players have done some research into how a Violet Fungus works, they'll realise that 
as they've been traveling through this entire dungeon filled with this fungus, there's a good chance that many of those things were other creatures that got trapped by the harpy's song and wandered into their own death. So hopefully that's given you some ideas to get started with what kind of monsters you can use near the beginning of the game. It's actually been a fun little departure from the channel's usual content, and who knows, if people like it, maybe I'll continue it on in the future. So if you guys want to see more combinations of monsters that can be used together at higher levels, then leave some comments down below and I'll see if I can work that in with the rest of the regular content. Hopefully that will give you guys some ideas beyond the basic opening creatures. However, most and least used creatures is a very subjective term, because essentially it's whatever your DM decides they want to put on the table for you. What's best of all, however, is players start to see how certain monsters' abilities complement each other and can be a real hassle for them when they're trying to take them down. So perhaps it'll teach your players to respect the monsters a little bit more and not just view them as the next source of XP. If you're into these creature combos, then why not leave a like? If you'd like me to carry on with this in the future, leave a comment down below. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, then why not consider doing so? And if you'd like to be notified about new stuff that comes up from the channel, make sure you hit that bell notification. And finally, if you would like the channel and the community to grow, then why not share the content around? Then we can all have a discussion about what our favourite monster combinations are. And with all that being said, I will see you guys next time at the gaming table.